Chapter Three of Our Army at the Front. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Our Army at the Front by Haywood Brown. Chapter Three The First Division Lands. They saw the gray troopships steaming majestically into the middle distance from the gray of the open sea, with the little convoy fleet alongside. It was a gray morning, and at first the ships were hardly more than nebulous patches of a deeper tone than sea and sky. As they neared the port and took on outline, the watchers increased and took on internationalism. The Americans, who had come to see this consequential landing, some in uniform and some civilians, had arrived in the very early morning before the inhabitants of the little seaport town were up and about, let alone aware of what an event was that day to put them into the history books. But it never takes a French civilian long to discover that something is afoot, what with three years of big happenings to sharpen his wits and keep him on the lookout. At the front of the quay were Americans, too deep, straining to make out the incoming ships, on tiptoe to count their number, breathless to shout a welcome to the first old glory to be let loose to the harbor winds. Forming rapidly behind the Americans were Frenchmen, French women, and French children, indifferent to affairs, kitchens, or schools, chattering that, Mais sûrement que sont les Americans, regardez, regardez ignominiously in the rear but watching too were the german prisoners who worked in theory at least at transferring rails from inconvenient places to convenient ones for the loading of coaster steamers they said little enough having learned that a respectful hearing was not to be their lot for a while but they moved fewer rails than ever and nobody bothered to speed them up the great ships came in slowly before long the watchers could see lines of dull yellow banding the gray hulks and then the yellow lines took on form and separateness and were visible one soldier at a time last one ship steamed apart from the others and made direct for the quay and the solemn business of landing american troops on french soil was about to begin there was to be a certain ceremony for the landing but like all the ceremonies conceded to these great occasions by the american army it was to be of extreme simplicity when they were near enough to the quay to be heard the transport band played the star-spangled banner while all the soldiers stood at salute and then they played the marseillaise while everybody on ship and shore stood at salute with that they called it a morning as far as celebration was concerned and to the accompaniment of a great deal of talk and a volley of light-hearted questions they began to disembark the first question called from some distance away was what place is this the next was do they let the enlisted men drink in the saloons over here and there was a miscellany about apple pie and doughnuts cigarettes etc and very briefly after the first soldiers were ashore nothing could be heard but don't they speak any english at all the outstanding impression of that morning may be what it will to the french civilians to the american newspaper correspondents and to the officers both ashore and on board to the privates of the first division it will always be the incomprehensible nonsense that goes by the name of the french language spoken with perfect assurance by people old enough to know better who refuse to make one syllable of intelligible sound in answer to even the simplest requests the privates were prepared to hear the french speak their own language at mention of alsace lorraine and war aims or to propound their private philosophies that way they granted the right of the french to talk how they pleased of their emotional pleasure at seeing the troops or of any other subject above the timber line what staggered them was the insane top loftiness of using french to ask for ham and eggs and beer or the way to camp for nothing 
not volumes of warning before they left home nor interminable hours of french grammar instruction on board the troop ships had really got it deep inside the american private's head that french was not an accomplishment to be used as evidence of cosmopolitan culture but a mere prosy necessity without which daily existence was a nightmare and a frustration the french on their side were helpless enough but not so bewildered they had lived too long in peace as well as war across a narrow channel from that staunch english-speaking race who brought both their tea and their language with them to france and everywhere else to be dumbfounded that strangers should balk at their foreign tongue the inevitable result was that here in their first contact with the french as later throughout the fighting areas the american soldiers learned to understand french english long before they could speak a decent word of french fortunately for the first division it had had some able bilingual forerunners at the seaport town where they landed the camps had been built by the french a few miles back from the town but a few of the housekeeping necessities had been installed by general pershing's staff officers and signs in good plain english showed the proper roads and as the single files of soldiers began to descend the gangplank of the first transport and to form for marching to camp their own officers were having some compact instruction from the staff officers on how to get to camp and what to do when they got there there was no waste motion about getting the troops under way the first companies were tramp tramping up the streets before the last companies were overside and the first transport was free to go back and give place to the next one before the mayor had got his red sash and gilt chains in place and arrived to do them suitable honor so while the shore watchers fell back into safe observation posts the soldiers clattered down through the quay sheds to the little street formed and swung away and one ship after another disgorged its passengers and presently the sheds were overrun with the blue-clad sailors from the convoys all that day the soldiers marched through the town their camps lay at the end of a long white shore road and jobs were not wanting when they got there their pace was easy because of these things and they probably would not have put out any french eye with their flawless marching even under less indulgent circumstances for this first division was recruited in a hurry and most of their real training lay ahead of them where they were impressive was in their composite build there were little fellows among them but they straggled at the back the major part of the soldiers were tall thin rangy looking with a march that was more lope than anything else and a look of heaving their packs along without much effort they fell about midway between the thin breedy look of the first english troops in france and the stocky thick-necked sort that came later the marines were the pick of the lot for size and behavior too the sense of being something special was with the marines from the first they marched that way and set apart by their olive drab as well as by their size and comportment they gave the first division's first march in france a quality of real distinction and when the army got to its first french camps the welcome sight its eyes first fell upon was that of already arrived marines carrying water down the hill the camps were long wooden buildings rather above the average as became the status of the visitors built almost at the top of the hill looking down over green fields and round trees to the three or four villages within range of vision and beyond them to the sea some supplies were there already but the soldiers had had to bring most of their first supper and the camp cooks had their own troubles getting things just so major general siebert field commander of the first division had quarters at camp so that excuses were not in order even for that first supper the marines and all others they could commandeer to help them were rushing about preparing things to the very top of their bent nobody had town leave for the first day or two till things were in apple pie order and the camp was in line to shelter and feed its soldiers for as long as it should be necessary to stay there if camp life was busy these days the town life was no less so 
the chief hotel wherein much red plush met the eye from the very entrance was swarming with officers of both nations and all degrees of rank general pershing was there with his aides and most of his staff admirals were there changing uniforms from blue to white and back again as the erratic french weather dictated there were half a dozen high officers from the french army making both formal and informal welcomes and there were more busy majors and captains and more interpreters than you could count in half a day's time the little french woman who sat behind the desk was amiable to the best of her very considerable ability but the questions she had to answer whether she understood them or not would have addled an older head than hers she could run her hotel with the best of them but when perfectly sane-looking young officers asked her where to buy five thousand cups and saucers and paper napkins by the ton she said in so many words that an american invasion was worse than bedlam the hotel's second floor was the favored place for conferences there a fair welter of red plush was drawn up around a big table in the hallway and a livid red wallpaper added its warmth to a scene which against a blank wall would not have lacked color at this table general pershing could have been found much of the time the whole practical liaison of french and american armies was contrived here though the first rule for this consolidation laid down by a grizzled french general with but one arm left was that there was no longer anything that was french or anything that was american but merely all we had that was ours so that the task was one of detail only though the daytimes were packed with work most of the officers called it a day at sunset then the little hotel took on its most engaging color the little french piano tinkled out in the warm air with an accompaniment of many voices once a very blue young second lieutenant chose to express his mood by repetitions without number of the melancholy warum probably the first german music that had been heard from that piano for many a moon possibly those of the french who knew what the tune was recognized also that america had turned a point in more ways than one in coming to france not least among them being making good american soldiers out of erstwhile good germans nobody seemed much astonished or put out when within the day a goodly number of american soldiers were speaking to german prisoners in their own language though talking to the german prisoners aside from the fact that it was not encouraged by the french turned out to be indifferent fun since the american soldiers had had their fill of german propaganda before they left home and none of the prisoners was over modest as to what germany was or would do the cafes out of doors were overflowing with americans too it was plenty of fun to hear the sailors scolding the french waitresses for calling lemons limons and trying to overhaul the french pronunciation of biere to something approaching a compromise an officer came along and broke up a crap game the soldiers forgave him but the civilians did not it was their first go at the game and they wanted a lot of teaching the lone bookstore of the town made the only known effort to get the americans what they asked for instead of trying to prevail on them to adopt something french they sent perhaps to paris to get english books and they piled their windows high with macaulay's history of england and bacon's essays the paper buying habit is ingrown in the american mail he has three newspapers under his arm before any afternoon is what it should be and so the soldiers bought the french papers two and three at a time and carried them around any time of day or night a lookout into the town's main street descried a company or two of soldiers on their way from camp for town leave or on their way back they marched continually the motorcycle with the side seat which was later to be the distinguishing mark of the american army in paris made its appearance in the seaport within a day or two of the first transport's landing and eased the burdens of the french motor lorries with which the american supplies had been taken to camp 
owing to a delay of the first division's own lorries on a slow ship and most successful sensation of all the army mule the french knew him slightly because their own army used him on occasion but no frenchman could speak to a mule in his own language as these big mule tenders did it was exalting to watch the army on the march to see the marines and the profusion of slim sailors but the real crowd always gathered around the big negro stevedores in long navy blue coats scarlet lined with brass buttons all the way up the front over and down the back likely a thrifty hand-me-down from pre khaki days who march with perfect knowledge of their magnificence the stevedores for their part were as amazed at the french though on a different score they accepted with due resignation the fact that the french spoke french it was when they first saw a Senegalese in french uniform triple black with tropic suns but to them a mere one of themselves and when they hailed him gladly in their english tongue to ask which road to take that his indecipherable french answer broke them heart and spirit alike that one blame stuck-up nigger said the spokesman as they trudged their way onward none the wiser if the Senegalese, in his turn had been rebuking them in french for showing off their english so in its several aspects the first division made its impact upon france jostled itself a little and the french more and finally settled down to its short wait at the coast before going inland within sound of the guns to get its training and because the camps were to be used many times again by other divisions to come on the bridge of ships the first had to be put in some extra licks to make their camp conveniences permanent they played a few baseball games and they were encouraged to do a lot of swimming in the off afternoon hours after a bit town leave was heavily curtailed but there was a dispensation now and then for a movie in the main they kept their noses to the grindstone after a little while the men who were to march in paris on the fourth of july were selected and preceded by a few sailors with fewer duties and longer indulgences they entrained on the late afternoon of july second there was no measuring the disappointment of the ones who were left behind for the prediction that there would be doings in paris on the first french fourth of july was to be fulfilled to the letter but the housekeepers of the army could not be spared for celebration as soon as the marines could be dispatched from the seaport they were sent direct across france to the points behind the lines where their training camps were in waiting and there within a few weeks the first division reassembled and fell to work meanwhile of the doings in paris End of chapter 3